Unfortunately, I'm afraid to start accordingly. If I can welcome everyone to today's uh, transport committee. Um, as usual, just a few little bits of housekeeping to, to kick us off. Um, if anyone has got their mobile phone with them, which I expect everyone has, um, can we please make sure they're turned to, to silent uh, accordingly? Uh, can I also remind everyone that during the proceedings of the committee and the debates and sharing, please can we make sure we use the microphones accordingly and are a suitable uh, proximity to make sure everything we're saying is being picked up so everyone can hear the full uh, processing and proceedings of our discussions. Also as well, in terms of fire safety, we are not expecting a fire alarm today, so if we do have an um, alarm activation, uh, we obviously have to treat that as live, and for those of you that haven't ever heard the fire test in this building, it's a very polite lady uh, that comes across the, the tannoy uh, advising us what to do, um, and if we do need to evacuate, the uh, assembly point is just by the, the Museum of Liverpool. And finally as well, um, we do encourage um, all of our visitors um, to uh, participate in the filming and photography that they may wish to, to do. However, we always politely request if you do intend upon doing that, please could you speak to our democratic services team just to make sure that any of the equipment that might be being used uh, doesn't interfere with the audio visual kit that we've got in place uh, accordingly. Okay, uh, moving into um, <coughs> the uh, committee agenda then. Can I start just first and foremost by um, making uh, an announcement? Um, and it's very much to sort of thank uh, Councillor Sue Murphy from St Helens. Uh, Sue has informed us that she's standing down from this committee uh, because she's been elevated to the position of Deputy Leader of St Helens Council. So if I, on behalf of this committee and this organisation, uh, can actually thank Sue for all of her contributions over the past municipal year and genuinely kind of congratulate her on her new position and wish her every success that I'm sure she certainly will be in that new role as Deputy Leader of St Helens Council if I can do that accordingly. I also just want to, to give way uh, to Councillor Ron Abbey because I think Ron just wants to, to say a few key words as well. Thank you Chair, I'd just like to give you some thanks to uh, all the staff at Mayor of Travel and the elected members for the support they've shown me during my recent period readings. It is very much welcome. Um, I thank them for the loss of my heart for the support they've shown me. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Ron. Obviously, we're, we're all, all here for you, mate, and you and your family, and hope everything is going okay. Gordon? <coughs> Thank you, Chair. Um, I was going to uh, use uh, declarations of interest to, uh, to get my points across. I, I think, uh, if, uh, if we may be called, Chair, our congratulations to you and your good lady wife, Anna, on uh, the arrival of uh, a little Robinson, such a Beth, such a Beth. And uh, if we can be called that, uh, I'm sure you'll be uh, at your best form when you're kept awake all night and come to our committee, you'll, uh, you'll keep us all on our toes, I'm sure. Or well, maybe not all, maybe just me. <laughs> uh, many, many thanks for that, um, folks. I do keep joking with people that um, actually I found working now it's more difficult than dealing with newborn babies because at least I get to lie in a bed, which I wasn't technically allowed to do at Lime Street or Sheffield or those other places. I've worked through the evening, but thanks ever so much for those good wishes as well. Okay, if we um, move into um, the substantive agenda items, first one is apologies for absence. Um, have we had some apologies, Shona? Apologies have been received from Councillor Susan Murphy. We also need to add uh, Councillor Jimmy Jackson and Councillor Dennis Ball uh, accordingly, and I think otherwise, looking around the room, we are all present and correct. <coughs> Second item is declarations of interest, and that obviously is for me to remind any members if they are aware of any declarations that need to be made, either now or anything that might crop up during the proceedings of the committee and the debate that ensues, if we can declare that accordingly. Steve? Yes, Chair. Uh, under item six, the report on the Mersey Ferries, it refers to Woodside. 
Um, I'm currently chair of the planning committee in uh, Wood Border Council. This may be subject uh, of a plan of mission, but I will declare a personal interest as I will enter the planning committee at this meeting with a uh, fully open mind uh, on any decisions that need to be made in the future. Excellent, thanks Steve, and we can record that accordingly. If there's no further declarations, if we can move on to item three, which is the minutes of the last meeting. Um, <coughs> can I move that the minutes of the last meeting held on the 31st of January be approved as a correct record? Is that agreed? I shall add my uh, signature accordingly to those minutes. Right, um, the, the first substantive item, very, very significant one, uh, is we're having a presentation from our Director of Integrated Transport, Mick Moon, on the progress with Northern Powerhouse Rail and HS2 and its future serving the Liverpool City region. Um, I'll allow Mick to, to get up to the, uh, uh, the rostrum uh, accordingly, but I think this is a very significant presentation, some very significant progress that Mick's going to take us through. So Mick, over to you. Thank you. Um... I am assuming that you've all heard of Northern Powerhouse Rail. Oh, sorry. <laughs> you've all heard of Northern Powerhouse Rail. Uh, the way TFN put this, Transport for North, it's uh, a once in a lifetime opportunity to transport the rail network across the North. And obviously, we are very much part of that. Um, Steve Rodman, who is the veteran manager, you know, sits on the TFN board. Our chair, Councillor Robinson, also chairs the Rail North Committee. Those two individuals have, have got an awful lot to do with our input from a Liverpool City region perspective and have an awful lot to do with the success we've achieved. But also, at this point, also I'd like to thank a number of officers who've done uh, an, an amazing amount of work on this. Uh, I'd particularly the likes of Tom Carberry and Wayne Menzies from our rail division who uh, sit on our officer reference group at Transport for the North and I've kept the pressure up throughout over a number of years for what we're trying to achieve in Liverpool. So a big thanks to those people and many more indeed. Um, so in terms of um, <coughs> an introduction to the Northern Powerhouse Rail, there before you've got the, the timetable of what's gone on in the past. So going back to July 2014, we had the original One North, which was a, a proposition for an interconnected North, was the way they put it. So essentially that was the, the five city regions of uh, Leeds, Liverpool, Manchester, Newcastle and Sheffield coming together to promote what uh, we've now been fighting for, which is to improve the rail network across the north of England. We've then moved through a number of sequences uh, that have looked at what we can do in terms of upgrading particular routes and stations. So we've gone through from sequence one right through to uh, sequence three in February this year and we've now whittled down to a number of options that I'll come to later. So in terms of the um, vision, if you look at the actual uh, Northern Powers Rail Strategic Outline Business case, as, as it's called, that is the, the vision in there that you'll see. I've picked out the points that are for the Liverpool City region on this slide. So our, our main priority is to improve the capacity and frequency of links between Man uh, Liverpool and Manchester also, that will serve Warrington and Manchester Airport as intermediate destinations. Using the high-speed uh, two route infrastructure, they will provide access to Manchester Airport and Manchester, but also, and very importantly, to either upgrade Liverpool Line Street or possibly provide a completely brand new station here in Liverpool. In looking at the rest of the network for all of North of England, uh, that is also part of the vision for transport for the North. Uh, new integrated Northern Powerhouse Rail and High Speed 2 stations at Manchester Airport and Manchester Piccadilly. Faster transpire links between Manchester and Leeds. Upgrades to the existing routes between the likes of Manchester and Sheffield and Sheffield and Hull. Utilisation of uh, High Speed 2 between <coughs> Leeds and Sheffield. And significant upgrades to the East Coast Main Line. So, massive amount of work and a massive amount of ambition. Uh, well, that's what we as partners of uh, TFN have come together to try and push for, and hopefully we will get. Oh, apologies for the quality of that, that's not come out particularly well. Um, if anybody would like to see a clearer diagram of, of that, then uh, you know, I can certainly provide that to you. But I think the important thing to note is, um, I will show from here, is that, that is the link that we've been after that will provide access from high speed to into Liverpool. Uh, also touch points, as you can see, the points five and six 
statistics. They're known as touch points. They are the points where we will link into the high speed 2 network and it will provide access hopefully to, through to Manchester Airport, Manchester, onto Leeds, but most importantly for us all to go down to London in a, in a much quicker time than we can do now. In a bit more detail, and hopefully you can see that, uh, what's known as uh, TP5 and TP7, they are the touch points that I was referring to to the high speed 2 network. Secretary of State has already uh, confirmed approval of, of those touch points and provided the funding necessary to, to provide those touch points. So that is really good news for us. It, it shows a commitment to what we're after and hopefully if the NPR business case gets through, as, as we think it will, then that is, that is the, the beginning of the network that we're after. A lot of information on the uh, recent milestones, uh, I've touched upon the sequences, well sequence 3, phase 2, the strategic outline business case was considered by uh, the Transport to the North Board on the 7th of February and uh, the, good, good, the really good news is it was approved um, by, by all members uh, and that uh, is, is more difficult to, to say than you would believe because there was an awful lot of uh, worry right at the last minute on that and it, you know, there's been a political consensus now to approve the strategic outline business case and that's now been sub submitted to government. Statutory advice, and you might wonder why it says statutory advice, that's because TFN is now a statutory body so the government is obliged to listen to what TFN say to it and uh, uh, that's the advice there, points A through to, to D. Uh, a lot of information there but that, that shows you that uh, we want, that we now want the government to show its full commitment to NPR and ensure that the Treasury and Infrastructure Projects Authority assign the, the necessary long-term capital investment we need to, to bring this uh, network to fruition. The government should also commit to the long-term development funding to ensure NPR develops towards the consultation and consent stage by the early 2020s and early the first phase of construction from 2024. The government should consider a significant strength of role for TFN in the design and implementation of High Speed 2 Phase 2B, what we call TRU, TRU the Transparent Android Upgrade, and Network Rail Renewals Programme. Again, this is TFN um, showing how strong it aims to be. Uh, the, the politicians want uh, government to do what they want it to do and not necessarily what they want to do to the North. You know, the North is now developing its own strong voice and they expect government to listen to it. Finally, the government should recognise the critical role of NPR in regeneration and growth, working with the Northern Highway Trail partners, um, that, that the MP11, uh, the 11 LEPs across the whole of the north of England, so we want to work with that in terms of its uh, growth strategies. Finally, the SOBC translate the ambition and passion for a transport north into a robust a robust evidence base. You see the level of investment that we're after, £39 billion. Pounds. That's what we believe that this will cost. So that's what we believe that is needed to transform the north of England. And if the government are serious about its intention to rebalance the economy, then that is the sort of investment that we're looking for from the, from the government. Streets gap on my business case. Uh, I won't go through that, but essentially what, what that now leaves us with we, we've whittled down consideration of a huge number of options and alternatives to both routes and uh, stations throughout the whole of the north of England and uh, we, we continue with that at once is what we call sequence 4 next but I touched on earlier the, um, one of the real benefits for us is to hopefully achieve a journey time from here to London of 1 hour 20 minutes now we appreciate that is a huge uh, reduction in the journey time that we've currently got. But it, that connection to high speed 2 is the important thing. So now hopefully you can appreciate it. That's why we're pressing so hard to get that connection. The touch points I've referred to are the first step in that direction. Forthcoming milestones, as I say, we're touching on the preparation for sequence 4. The uh, high speed 2 Limited is designing those touch points. That's the actual detailed design. An awful lot in the press about the cost of high speed <coughs> um, whether it's doing the right thing, whether it's putting the money in the right places. Well, we will continue to push for what we believe is right for the city region. 
that work plan is in development itself, the most reconciliation options that I've referred to. Whilst there's still a number of options uh, between, say, uh, Manchester and <coughs> Liverpool, the, the three main route concepts, as they call, between Liverpool and Manchester, is that there'll be a new line south of Warrington, uh, a new or upgraded line actually through the centre of Warrington, or a tunnel route. Uh, some other groups under Warrington. They are options that uh, will now be considered in detail during sequence four. The two main stations that have concepts that I've touched on already is to actually improve Lime Street further than it already has been, or to provide a brand new station in Liverpool city centre. So there are a number of options being considered for that. Um, it's, it's not the sort of information that can be shared at the minute because obviously the possible implications of that. When the original One North proposition was put together, uh, it was put out there that uh, we'd have conditional outputs. Now, what conditional outputs are, are what we saw as aspirational journey times between the various destinations <coughs> of North of England, uh, as well as frequencies of trains between those destinations. So as you can see, for Liverpool to Manchester, the original conditional output was to be able to get between the two in 20 minutes the service frequency of six trains per hour. Again, a considerable improvement, as you appreciate, of what we've got at the moment. In terms of Liverpool to Manchester Airport, uh, a journey time of 30 minutes with at least two trains per hour. So they, they were the original One North conditional outputs. What we're actually seeing from work that um, Transport of the North has done with input from ourselves and, and Network Rail and High Speed 2 is that we are looking possibly at a a journey time of 21 minutes, that's on a non-stop service. A 25 minute journey time if we stop at Manchester Airport, and a virtually bang on 30 minutes between uh, with stops at Warrington and Manchester Airport. Service frequency, we have four trains per hour on a brand new route, with uh, two trains per hour on the existing slower journey. Uh, <coughs> so what, what are the expected benefits of, of MPR? You can see from that they're massive, and you can see why we're so determined to make sure we get those. So, 10 million people will have access to portable northern city within 90 minutes. The northern economy could grow by 3.4 billion pounds per annum. That should say an additional 2 million more people could reach Liverpool within 90 minutes. Again, that's significant for us as a city region. You think about the number of people that can get to Liverpool either to work or to come and visit the attractions, to spend money to set up new businesses within 90 minutes. That is a huge benefit for the city region. So as I say, the, our view is, and we've commissioned our own study to, uh, to look into this, is that what actually rail and NPR could mean for the local city region, there could be an additional £15 billion pounds in economic growth for GBA, 24,000 additional jobs, 11,000 new homes and 3.6 million pound visitors, yeah, new visitors to Liverpool. Again, what, what you, you probably more appreciate, again, this is where your, your officers have worked really hard on this, is that when TFN were first bringing together its NPR business case, there was very little reference made to the visitor economy. And your officers have, have fought long and hard to make sure that there is now substantial uh, input and section on the visitor economy <coughs> in the final strategic outline business case. So what are the next steps? Um, TFN and DIT are looking to reduce the number of group and station options where possible. Uh, key driver for us as I say is the journey time. We will keep pressing on that. We won't take our foot off the gas on that. Uh, we are to the point of being a pain on, on many occasions, but that's what we're here for. Uh, we seek a new twin track route at a new station in Liverpool city centre. Sequence 4 will commence in April of this year. Uh, the potential announcement we're hoping for will, will be in the uh, spend review. That's when we hope that we will get an announcement that, that will provide the funding to be able to take all, all this work on, on to the next steps. In the longer term, NPR will potentially need a hybrid bill. Um, that to go through the parliamentary process and in fact in all probability it will need one. Um, the real downside to that is because of the huge 
amount of work involved in a hybrid bill, the earliest that it's likely to get uh, an opportunity for submission is 2024. Nothing happens quickly, unfortunately, as you well know, in the real industry, uh, and, and, and this is no exception. Uh, NPR needs to synchronise with high speed too. So it says there the potential delivery of NPR reaches stations by 2033. So again, that's the, the one downside. We, we'd like these things to happen much quicker, but they are the sort of time scales that we're looking at. So by 2020, uh, Transport the North wants the North leaders to agree on a single network concept. That means a huge amount of work, and more importantly for the likes of Liam and the other decision makers, deciding exactly on uh, the likes of what will be the priority. Which of those routes across the whole of the north of England will receive the priority to go first? And that's what everybody will probably be fighting for, understandably, and I'm sure uh, Liam and Steve will, will be no exception to that rule. But until at this point, uh, there is no set priority uh, that is work that will now have to be done as we move forward. So, realize that that's a quick one through. Uh, Liam, I think that's what you wanted. So, happy to take any questions. Thanks, Matt. That was magnificent. I'm sure we'll have quite a few. We've got Gordon and we've got Tony. Thank you, Chair. Uh, a number of questions at the uh, presentation has uh, made up for me. One would be with Lime Street Station. So we're talking about the high speed linkage that we get. Uh, if, I'm, if I'm not mistaken, it would be quite the lengthening of some platforms. And that would be the way it would be done. How would that fit in with the proposed uh, changes to Lime Street Station as put forward by the Liverpool City Council? It's like, you know, digging the road up, filling it in a picture, and something else comes along there. I've got a couple more. I, th I think any, any work of that nature would have to be done, obviously, with, with the Liverpool City Council Coalition. You know, the, the work, the, the good news is, is that uh, the likes of Tom Wayne and, and so on, their expertise is such that, uh, that they actually advise transport to the north rather than the other way around. Um, and that, that's the way we like it. Um, we've often tried to, to uh, foist our expertise on, on TFN, so we, we, we've certainly got no worries in that regard. I think just to interject as well, Gordon, all of that work has been shared with the City Council and there's a lot of detailed work around what the station options could be and what might need to be done to sort of reflect all of that. So that genuinely is all in hand. Thank you for that reassurance. In your, in your slides you have the, uh, the latest groups and uh, I'm minded to think of John Pittman's comments in his introduction uh, on, on this on the subject that the importance of the linkage between places and airports and he stresses that linkage. Has, has Mersey Travel remonstrated on the issue about the removal of the South Port to Manchester Airport, Bruce? Uh, well, I would hope you know that we have. Um, we certainly have and, and we will certainly continue to do so. We, you know, the, uh, we, 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 we've certainly represented your views, Councillor Friel, and uh, we'll continue to do so. Yeah. And if I can continue, I'm trying to go as quickly as I can do it. With the NPR, uh, is it £38 million that's up for the moment? Remember that figure right. Whatever the figure is, how much is to be spent on, on improving freight? Particularly minded that we've got the links to the Trans Pennine. Uh, I'm sure everyone here is equally as fed up with me, even about Brexit. But one of the things we do need is that. Uh, west to East Coast connectivity between those ports within the North of the Prosperity and for the environment. So what allocation in terms of spending to do such works as gauge cleans, etc., has been allocated? Very difficult to answer that. And I, I, what I would say is that uh, we are very, very conscious of the fact that not uh, as much emphasis is being put on uh, catering for freight in, in the NPR work. And again, we have probably more than anybody else, I think Tom would probably agree, have uh, emphasised the case for it more than any other authority, I think, because of the importance of it to us. Uh, in terms of an actual amount that, that might be spent on freight, again, that's, that's certainly too difficult to answer at the minute, because whilst the figure that, that was on the board was 39.5 billion for the whole of NPR, uh, it, it can't be broken down at this point in time as to what would be spent on freight. 
Now, in terms of the Transpan I Boots upgrade, again, we, uh, I, I, I made the point at the last Transport for the North Exec Board mm -hmm. that whilst uh, the Transpan I Boots upgrade is, is a great thing, in the, in the main, at the moment, it, it, it's for, it very much favours passenger movements as opposed to freight movements. It certainly will not, as it stands, uh, provide the necessary capacity in terms of gauge clearance that, that we need, I'll say we as the Liverpool City region, and certainly the Port of Liverpool needs to get freight movements across the Pennines. There is another proposal currently being looked at using the Skipton Coal route that may well provide uh, additional freight capacity, uh, but our, our strongly held view is, is that we should hold out to uh, try and get the trench behind routes upgrade to include the necessary stage uh, gauge clearance as needed. Thank you. I, I, I think it's quite a number of the three, but I think one of the understandings we need to have in our rail networks is that the freight, we have the gridlock situation going to uh, the chat loss going into the airport and we need a line to be dedicated to that. But currently a freight train would take something around two hours to get out of the city centre, if I'm not mistaken. What investment is being put in? So there are many just strategic things that are needed. And I'm sure you've been advocating this on me. But just for the record, I am giving that warning <coughs> now that it really does need an investment nationally from this government to be put into rail freight for the for the, uh, for the betterment of the environment and the betterment of the economy. And I'll tell you, I'll tell you now, you know, if I was asked to give any additional recommendations in, in what you put earlier on to the Secretary of State, mine would have been resigned immediately. I think as officer, I can't comment on that. But um, what I will say is that we have definitely pushed the case for freight. And that one, of, one of the uh, benefits of providing a new line between Liverpool and Manchester is that it will, it will free up freight paths on the existing network. And again, whilst that's not specifically mentioned on the slides, that is one of our primary objectives, is to free up those paths for freight movements. Can we get a copy of the slides? Yeah. Thank you, Chair. Absolutely. Uh, Tony. Thanks, Chair. Thanks, Mayor. <coughs> Mine just echoes what the Lord is saying regarding freight. It, 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 it is going to be a big challenge because where we face and where, where Liverpool docks have been improved to, to take on container ships that provide 19,000 containers, how those 19,000 containers are going to get off the ship and into communities is a challenge anyway, it's a challenge on the road network, let alone the freight network on the road rail, but it needs to be addressed, because if we do four out of the European Union, we do four out of no deal, then those products will still be required, and they'll still have to be delivered to this country, and that's moved from a regional hub to a national hub. So the national provision for the whole country will come from Liverpool. Now, if that's not addressed, we've got our major problems. <coughs> the, the other question is regarding the um, facilitation of transport for the north. So far, as I understand, it's the authorities that have, come, have made contributions in order to get all the technical work done. Get all the data done, all the officer hours, you know, uh, officer hours in order to to make the bids. Have the government make a contribution to say you can facilitate this. This this whole project can be facilitated with this particular amount of money. I think in terms of the contributions, you're quite right. That we we as the Liverpool City Region and indeed every every partner within Transport for North has committed and put in an awful lot of officer time and, and indeed member time. In, in development of the strategic airline business case. They are costs that, that we as an authority and indeed every other authority have taken on board themselves. <coughs> but the actual cost of developing that work, all the modelling, all the economic analysis, all the production of documents, all the transport of the North staff, so on and so forth, that is already paid for by government. So we as an authority, apart from the staff time, the likes of uh, you know, the officers put in, uh, it doesn't actually, there's no capital or even revenue contribution outside of that that, that we make to TFM. To, to John. Thanks, 
Chair, thanks for making your presentation. Just, just referring back to this uh, magic number of 39 billion, given the current climate of austerity in the country, and you're looking at something like 2024, is this a realistic figure? And if we fall short of that 39 billion, how adversely will that impact on our plans? It's a realistic figure as Transport for the North can estimate at this point. In, in, in fact, the, the, what they call the Long Term Investment Programme, which is the investment programme that is drawn on now, not just for rail but for road as well, um, is, is approaching £70 uh, million pound, uh, over a 30 year time scale. But uh, TFN's view is, and um, you know, it's, it's difficult for us to, to argue against that, is that the, the, what they reckon is needed for the rail network is 39.5, and the, you know, the, as I say, the TFN board are adamant that they will push for that. They will not accept second best, um, and, the, and that's their view. Uh, that's a firmly held view, um, and that they will continue to push for that. Um, in terms of, uh, well, what's the option B or plan B, uh, we don't even want to consider that. Because it, as soon as we admit that, that there's a plan B, which there isn't, then it will be scaled back, and we've got no intention of scaling back. Sounds a bit like Theresa with Brexit, though. <laughs> Any further? Questions or comments then, or what's the rest? Harry? Um, can you just check, will the slides be made available to us? Yeah, that's no problem with that, yeah. yeah. Um, if there's no further questions or comments, I'll just do a little bit of kind of summing up, because I think that was an excellent presentation, thank you, really kind of. Um, distills a hell of a lot of detail into something that's um, much more accessible. Um, but. Um, I'm, yeah, first and foremost, I'd like to kind of echo your thanks to sort of all the teams that have been involved, particularly kind of Wayne and Tom have done an exceptional job on this. You kind of made the point about um, how at times we've been a pain. Um, I'd turn that around a bit and actually say that kind of the most studious, diligent, and conscientious city region in the old north of England is the Liverpool city region because we've regularly been pointing out when plans sort of come up short and through expertise of our team, actually point out kind of what the reality should be. So I think, that from my experience of being in some of those meetings as well, quite often we've been making the arguments that other areas across the north then kind of truck in behind us because we're actually coming to this from a very, very strong evidence-based position. And I think we're getting to quite an exciting stage with all of this. You know, kind of when I looked at your timescale slide, it's a full it starts to be a bit scary when you think about how long we've been working on this, but if we replay history ever so quickly, um, when the notion of high-speed rail first come, came into being, really, in this country, it first sort of got announced, it was almost 10 years ago um, now, and at that period of time, the Liverpool city region, unfortunately, did not feature on the map, and there was a whole host of reasons why government uh, was telling us why we couldn't have full high speed links into the city, into the city region. And we always knew that was wrong. And um, particularly when we think about that fantastic work that was done first as One North, which was back in 2014, now five years ago. I remember going to the first meeting of One North, representing the city region in Manchester Town Hall. Um, and genuinely, the sort of impetus behind this whole project has come from the north of England. It wasn't the government doing this, it wasn't the government either instructing us to do it or saying we'll do this as a favour. It was the North coming together and saying we genuinely need all of this to rebalance the British economy and actually give us a fair and equitable stake in this country we haven't had for many, many decades. What's been great is the way that something that started as a concept, that nice idea of a kind of brand new railway line sort of stretching across the North, is now shaping up to be almost a proper plan and a project. And that means that the genie is out of that bottle and it's much more difficult to stuff back in. There are a lot of things we've got to keep um, cracking on with. Um, the point that kind of Gordon and Tony made about freight is absolutely vital. This isn't just about fast passenger services across the north. Yeah, it'd be wonderful for us to be able to get to Manchester non-stop in 20 minutes and another half hour on to Leeds. That's great. But actually what is, I would argue, even more important 
is the fact that that frees up capacity on the conventional rail network for the movement of goods and freight. Well, that only works if you've got that gauge clearance that you were pointing out about, because the Northern Powerhouse Rail Network would be a dedicated passenger network. It's not going to have freight trains on it. So we've got to make sure that the Trans Pennine route upgrade does include suitable clearance for freight trains so we can generally get that kind of uplift in the movement of goods as well. The final point I'll make is about priority. Let, let's not kind of be um, in any doubt here. We want all of that, we want all delivery, because that's not just in the interest of the North of England, it's in the interest of the whole of the UK. I would go as far to say that Northern Powerhouse Rail has to be the next national infrastructure uh, rail project as a priority. But you've got to start somewhere. You've got to put the spade in the ground somewhere first. Now, when it comes to where is the natural place to start for that, it is the leg between Liverpool and Manchester. And I'm not saying that parochially. We're saying that on the basis of hard evidence. We already know the strongest city-to-city -city links across the north of England in terms of passenger journeys is already Liverpool to Manchester, Manchester to Liverpool. So we've already got that strong demand. When you think about um, trips to London, after Manchester, Liverpool has the highest number of trips to London, and actually Liverpool has the highest number of trips from London to a city in the north of England. So that argument, that link onto HS2 is compelling as well. And when you distill all that down, in business case terms, the actual corridor on the Northern Powerhouse Rail Network that has the strongest business case that not only kind of helps our argument but actually justifies the strength of the business case for the whole network is the Liverpool to Manchester corridor. Added to the fact that these are big construction projects but much of this would be going over flat, vacant agricultural land in construction terms, it's reasonably straightforward to start on our leg in ways that it isn't as easy to do on other legs across the north of England. So I get quite excited about where we've got to, a lot more that we've got to do, and we've got to make sure that whilst the view from the moral high ground has been wonderful, opening you know, government's eyes to the fact that kind of, there is a requirement, a need and demand for high-speed rail link all the way into the Liverpool city region, we can't stop until we see the thing up and running, as Mick pointed out, hopefully at a point in the 2030s. And at that point, genuinely all of us, because you know, when you think about how we've all fought for this, whether you're members of this committee, whether you're members of staff in this organisation, whether it's the city region leaders, whether it's all the stakeholders knitted into that, genuinely we should be very, very proud that when we get to a point in the 2030s and those brand new trains come all the way into Lime Street Station, we can all take some satisfaction that we've genuinely done something that will sort of uh, set the city region in good stead for the next two centuries. So, a lot done, we've got to a great place, but so much more to do to make sure we get this up, running, built, operational, delivering massive economic change for our region and beyond. Okay, yeah, don't worry about that. Okay, if there's um, no further questions or comments, if I can then sort of uh, uh, ask that we know mix uh, presentation accord. Okay. Fifth item is the quarter three corporate plan performance and financial monitoring report. And we've got Jason and Stephen that are going to. Uh, well, no, it's. Uh, uh, yeah, I was going to say, I'm just reading up my notes. We've got Stephen and we've got. Um, yeah, he's got to catch him and he's got to deal with it.
postponed to date, a projection of a light downturn, and performance against budget. The table also provides various analysis so that we can see how the legal services are performing against their budget. Current projection is that there will be an underspending of 3.7 million um, for the financial year 18-19. Um, um, the key variance is the detail of um, um, section 4.4. Um, what this will mean, though, is that there will be a reduction in the requirement to utilise reserves to balance the budget for the current year. The next part is the capital programme. <coughs> um, the table at 4.7 provides um, a, a, a fairly high level breakdown of the capital programme for mercy travel. And again, um, this, is, this is showing the budget spent today and the projected outturn spent for each of the service areas. There is a more detailed breakdown of the capital programme which is pending to this report. Um, outturn spend is still, is still projected to be about 170 million, however, at quarter three, we're about 45% spent against the, the budget. Um, this isn't particularly out of line with the normal trajectory for capital spend, where there's normally a significant spend in the last quarter of the year. Final part of the uh, report at 4.9 and 10 details most travels and uh, reserve balances. Now, whilst it's worth noting that while the quantum still looks quite healthy, uh, these are very much in the main earmarked reserves, and there is a quite projected reliance on specific reserves to address specific pressures over the medium term. Um, I'm happy to take any questions now or whether anyone wants to come to us. Should we have the, the whole report and then we can, we can take questions of course? Okay, sure. uh, thanks, Sarah. Uh, so I'll go through the performance uh, of what is currently the Mersey Travel corporate plan up until the end of 2019. And I mention that because later on I'll, I'll, I'll just go into some detail about what how we're going to kind of change in uh, the future. So for the first part of the uh, report, you can see that the KPIs that there isn't a particular issue from my point of view. If you look at KPI 4, we do have a number of red in terms of punctuality. Uh, on page 19, it does explain some of the information as to why the bus punctuality has caused an issue during Q3. And just to note a correction I want to make on that page 2, uh, it mentions that the uh, Northern Rail operation for Q3 uh, has had an explanation so that you outlined above, but the not outlined above, apologies, they're actually on page 44, which is the punctuality KPI later on, so that's why I might sit down for it. As you can see, a lot of the other KPIs are all in the green, so I'm in the green zone. Um, something to note, which I, I constantly have to remind myself as I go through these reports, is this obviously Q3, so end of December, you may have already received and you've seen in the press, updated certain projects that we've delivered already, they will start to reflect into the Q4 reports. Um, as I said, there's nothing huge that I would say looks uh, difficult uh, or anything that needs to be dealt with specifically for, on the KPI side. <coughs> if we move to page 21, which is where we start with the priorities that we're delivering. So obviously the whole aim of the priorities and the activities that are being delivered is that they encourage the KPIs to go in the directions that we want them to be. Uh, as you can see from page 21, we're tracking at the moment 231 activities 